And now I am pleased to introduce the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, Dr. Holly Humphrey. Thank you, Peter, and welcome everyone. Let me begin today by introducing today's panelists. First, Dr. Stephen Davis is the director of the Master of Health Administration program at the University of North Texas Health Science Center School of Public Health. He is also the national chair of the American College of Healthcare Executives LGBTQ Healthcare Leaders Community. Today is an important day for him because not only is it his mother's birthday, but he officially begins a three-year term as regent at large for the American College of Healthcare Executives, a role that was created to promote diversity and inclusion in healthcare leadership. Our second panelist is Dana Levinson, the Associate Dean for Medical School Administration at the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine. In this role, she is charged with the administrative responsibility to implement programming and services for students which support and promote an inclusive climate and community at this particular medical school. And finally, our third panelist is Dr. Mark Schuster, who is the founding dean and CEO of the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. He has been conducting research on LGBTQ plus issues throughout his entire career, publishing on sexual and gender minority health in the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as other major journals. In addition, his published version of the speech, Being Gay in Medicine, went viral and is being used today in colleges and medical schools across the country as an important teaching tool. Let's turn to an outline of what we hope to accomplish in today's webinar. I will begin by providing an overview of a conference from which a good deal of the material that we're going to cover today originated. And in fact, let me mention that today's panelists all attended the conference that I will be referring to. Then we will turn to a background that is specific to LGBTQ plus issues, followed by Macy Conference recommendations as they pertain to today's topic. And then we're going to do our best to save the majority of our time for a question and answer experience with all of you. We will conclude today with some follow-up comments and an outline of future webinars that we have planned. Okay, let's get started. So the conference that I'm referring to took place just a little over a year ago, the last week of February in 2020. I know it's hard for all of us to even try to remember what life was like back in February of 2020, but believe it or not, we were still gathering in, play, in, in person and 44 leaders gathered in Atlanta, Georgia for a conference to address harmful bias and eliminate discrimination in our health professions learning environments. We spent three days doing that work and the result of that conference is published and can be found on our website at the link that you see on the screen in front of you. It is on our website under the publications tab and you will see the full report. You will get a sense of the deliberations that we had. You will see the names of all 44 participants who attended and participated in that meeting. The meeting was a part of a year long planning process where the planning committee commissioned four papers and three case studies. Those four papers and three case studies provided the background from which our recommendations ultimately developed. We then had a consensus set of recommendations 
that came out of that conference. And you will see not only the recommendations, but all of the action steps that, a, that accompanied those recommendations in the full report. Okay, let's move on. And I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Steph, Dr. Stephan Davis. Stephan? Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just ple pleased to be here, so thrilled to be here talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Actually, when I began my healthcare uh, journey, it was due to a quote uh, that really inspired me from Martin Luther King that said, that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. And so, you know, much of why we're here to talk about this topic today is because of the injustices faced by the LGBTQ community. We're all probably very aware of many of the health disparities faced by the LGBTQ plus community, including increased substance use, increased risk of STIs. We have to ask ourselves, why is all of that the case? And so just wanna really quickly touch on some experiences including one that I learned about at the beginning of my uh, nursing school journey, Flanagan versus the University of Maryland hospital system. Uh, that was a case where uh, Bill Flanagan was trying to visit his partner at University of Maryland shock trauma. He was dying of AIDS and he had durable power of attorney, was also the domestic partner in California. Uh, the hospital staff said that they did not view domestic partners as family, so denied him the right to see his partner at that time. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's really important to look back at that at the turn of the century, as well as the experiences of Robert Eads, who was a trans man in Georgia, who uh, went to see dozens of, dozens of providers because he knew that he had a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. None of the providers that he went to see were willing to have him in their practice because they felt that it would be detrimental uh, with other uh, cisgender patients waiting in the lobby and what have you. So was denied care and ultimately died. Tyra Hunter, who you see on the left, um, was a black trans woman uh, in DC who was hit by a car and the EMS began uh, providing care to her until they removed her clothing uh, when they were performing CPR and then realized that she was trans and instead of taking care of her, started to make fun of her. Um, and it wasn't, only, it wasn't until the bystanders uh, who witnessed this accident uh, called the EMS supervisors, demanded that they pr resume providing care, that they did so. She ultimately was then taken to DC General Hospital where she was also provided substandard care and died. And if you look at the postmortem on this specific case, um, there, it was determined that she had a great likelihood of survival had she received timely care. So fast forward, because that was these cases were at the turn of the century and sort of uh, the prelude to my experiences in studying uh, healthcare, both nursing and then healthcare leadership and management. Fast forward to recent reports. So you can see why the Healthcare Quality Index, which comes from the Human Rights Campaign, and it's to avoid experiences like these, which you see there uh, on the screen. So one is a patient who walked towards the women's bathroom, a trans woman, and uh, they were basically told that they could go to the McDonald's instead of the restroom in their facility. Also, you'll see that a gay man mentioned his husband and then the hospital staff who had been quite warm to him all of a sudden went cold and started being less responsive to his needs. So these experiences, although you know the ones that I mentioned initially are quite dramatic, we're still seeing these types of microaggressions, these types of discriminatory behaviors, uh, expressions of bias, even in the present day. And this has led to recent reports, one in 2015 that was conducted you know, with trans patients, showing that a third of trans patients have reported a negative experience. A quarter of them will avoid care altogether because of fear of mistreatment. There were similar studies that were done on this uh, for the broader LGBTQ community previously. So this is the why of, of what we're talking about today. Next slide, please. So when we look at these experience for LGBTQ patients that I mentioned, one of the problems when we, when we look to improve health and well-being for gender and sexual minorities is that we often don't have data. Many of our healthcare organizations still are not collecting what we call SOGI or sexual orientation and gender identity information, despite the fact that there's a large percentage of the population that identifies as LGBTQ+, uh, particularly when we look among the millennial population, those numbers are growing. And yet we have inconsistent data collection. The other issue is that we know that 
there's a great degree of variation in how people identify. So are we asking the right questions even when we do collect that information? So for instance, along generational lines and also perhaps racial lines, we're not necessarily always using the correct term terminology. So while some people may feel that the term queer resonates with them and is the umbrella term for the LGBTQ community, there are some people who do not like that label. Uh, same goes for some men who have sex with men but may not want to identify as being gay. Uh, so we do have to look at, at language as we look at the gender and sexual minority community. And we also should be looking at intersecting identities. So looking at race and LGBTQ identity, gender, et cetera. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Mark Schuster. So uh, thanks. I'm going to continue with the theme of a lack of data. We have very limited data on the number characteristics and experiences of sexual and gender minority students and providers. That's changed a little bit recently because the Association of American Medical Colleges began collecting data on sexual orientation and gender identity among med students in 2016. And I've got a graph here um, where you can see it's from their med school graduation questionnaire. It's when students are about to graduate. And it shows an increase over five years. Um, in several categories. And what's interesting is we're not sure whether there's an actual increase among med students or whether it's just that in the first few years there was so much fear of breach of confidentiality that people held back a bit. Um, I looked hard. I could not find any other large-scale data collection on sexual orientation and gender identity for nursing students, for nurses, for physicians, for other health professionals. We need data. We just need a few questions added into existing surveys. They can be put in with the other demographic questions. Um, and without data, we don't even know how many people are out there um, in clinical settings and what the trends are over time. We can't answer questions like, like how are they treated in school? How do they progress in their professional careers? Are they, are they leaving school? Are they leaving jobs at higher rates? Are they concentrating in certain parts of the country? Do they gravitate towards or avoid certain fields? How do experiences differ for men, women, and non-binary clinicians? How do experiences differ for um, people of different race and ethnicity? And how does intersectionality play into all of this? We need high quality representative data. I'm gonna go into the next slide. So, Many healthcare students and professionals report concealing their sexual or gender identities due to fear of discrimination. A study of US and Canadian med students from a decade ago found that about a third of sexual minority med students hid their sexual orientation, often because of fear of discrimination. About 60% of gender minority students did the same. Going back a bit further, a study of LGBTQ plus nurses found that many reported not being out to coworkers and that their workplaces were not LGBTQ friendly. And these clinicians, they may have valid reasons for fearing discrimination. Many non-LGBTQ people in the US would prefer not to have a sexual minority or gender minority doctor. A study from 2018, that's not that long ago, it found that 30% of non-LGBTQ Americans would feel very were somewhat uncomfortable if they found out their doctor was LGBTQ+. And another study found that people would actually switch their doctors over that. And bias doesn't only just come from patients. Um, another study, I know I got a lot of studies here, but I think they're important. A study of heterosexual med students found that nearly half expressed some explicit bias against LGBTQ people. That's from 2015. And this kind of bias is, of course, um, terrible for their classmates who are sexual or gender minorities, but it's also alarming for their future patients um, to have biased clinicians. Um, another survey of Florida nurses found that 22% had high scores on a homophobia scale. And it's not just about bias. There's also overt mistreatment. In a study published in JAMA just last year using data from the same data actually that was on the prior slide, the AAMC graduation questionnaire, 44% um, of med students who identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual 
reported mistreatment in med school compared to half that percentage of heterosexual students. And 22% of the LGB students reported that they were subjected to offensive remarks or names related to their sexual orientation. Another recent survey of med students, this time in Canada, in Ottawa specifically, um, it's a study that included both LGBT and cisgender heterosexual students. It found that two out of five of these students reported experiencing or observing anti-LGBT jokes, rumors, and bullying by med students and others in their healthcare system. And there, there are similar studies of practicing physicians. It's not just about students. Um, one study found that two thirds of LGBT physicians had heard derogatory comments about LGBT individuals in their workplace, and a third had witnessed discriminatory care of an LGBT patient. Um, I find all of this really concerning, and, um, but that's it for our background, and I'm gonna turn things um, over to Dana now to introduce us to our recommendations. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, clearly, we, we have our work cut out for us. And so in this next section, what we are going to do is go through the recommendations that emerged from the 2020 Macy Foundation Conference and consider how these action steps, which are broadly drawn and intended to be broadly um, inclusive of many different areas, consider how they can be applied to meet the specific needs of LGBTQ learners. Um, and when we talk about LGBTQ, it's obvious we are talking about an extremely heterogeneous group. Um, if these learners are experiencing bias or discrimination, it could be for LGBTQ identity, but it could also be for their race, their ethnicity, their disability status, their gender. It is possible that our LGBTQ learners are experiencing privilege in one of their identities and discrimination for another. And so if these experiences um, that the learners are having are multifaceted, um, our response is need to be as comprehensive and, and flexible as possible. Um, it is very clear that the work of anti-bias and inclusion too often falls on the shoulders of those who experience the bias and the discrimination. And it is not fair that that is so, it is the work of all. But I also think that leaders have a specifically important role because they have, you know, they have power and they have resources to make change and to hold others accountable. And um, I am a lover of inspirational language, um, and I think it's important, but um, putting resources behind words is um, probably the clearest demonstration of how seriously um, leaders are taking priorities. And um, one thing that I believe is very important to put resources behind are symbols of inclusion. Um, and these symbols need to be widespread and they need to be visible. And some of this can be very simply done um, and it can also become incredibly complicated um, and costly and hard to do. Um, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of things that um, we have tried to do at our institution or um, best practices that I have seen at other institutions that I very much admire um, as examples of what these symbols of inclusion might involve. Um, pronouns in all internal systems, admissions portals, name badges, email signatures, um, making gender neutral bathrooms broadly available, not just in clinical spaces as Stefan has pointed out as being so important, but also in health professions, learning environment spaces. I personally know more about building codes in Chicago than I ever expected to in the course of my life. But that deep dive into this complexity was worth it because it allowed us to make important changes in our space that mattered to our, to our community. We have to amplify representation in our institutional spaces and in our communications, um, in websites in particular, and in important pronouncements. But I also am um, a lifelong observer and lover of language. And I think it is really important that we be mindful for the very subtle, but very real heterosexual bias that we see in language in, and particularly in important communications and in what our teachers are saying in the classroom. Um, visibility is truly important and some institutions are just very out there. There are many schools, um, I, I'm particularly thinking of the University of Michigan who have outlets for faculty and students. 
there are some schools which provide explicit resources for LGBTQ students. And I recently had um, the remarkable experience of um, getting to look at a resource page that um, a young person who I got to know had created in Northwestern for LGBTQ pre-health students. And the specificity and depth and breadth of this resource and helping these students navigate the application process and to find their way into um, environments that were going to be supportive and inclusive of them was really mind blowing. Um, I have seen expressions of um, support, encouraging LGBTQ students to apply to schools. Northwestern does that, Stanford, UAB, others. And actually I wanna um, call out our, uh, my co-panelist, Dr. Mark Schuster. Um, can I have the next slide, Yasmin? Um, for his school, Kaiser Permanente, which includes statistics on sexual orientation and gender identity in the description of the matriculating class. And um, the making symbols of inclusion um, for sexual and gender minority individuals broadly visible is um, something that we do with facilities, but it's something that we need to be intentional and creative about in every component of what we do at a school, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's admissions, whether it's student programs. Yasmin, can I have the next slide, please? Um, our second recommendation um, is systems and the importance of data and measurement um, cannot be overstated when we talk about systems. And I'm gonna only touch on this briefly because Stefan is going to talk more about this later, but we are not going to develop, assess or improve systems to mitigate harmful biases against LGBTQ if we don't have a clear understanding of who is in our community. Let me add my voice to um, Dr. Schuster's in begging for data. We need to know who is in our community and we need to know what the experiences in our community are. And I think people, um, people identify what is important by the questions that we ask and maybe even more clearly by the questions that we don't bother to ask. So collecting sexual orientation and gender identity is a way to say that this is a component of structural diversity that really matters to us. And I finally, I wanna say that issues of trust are real and um, individuals have very good reasons not to trust. And so we have to be explicit and public. Why are we collecting this data? Who is gonna see it? How are we gonna use it? And then we have to hold ourselves scrupulously accountable to what we say our practices and policies are. And this is nowhere more true than when it comes to reporting on bias. And um, I, I spend a lot of my time, as I'm sure many people on this, um, this webinar do, with the AAMC graduation questionnaire. And I look at mistreatment data and we see that students don't often report mistreatment. And the reasons um, can range from this didn't seem important enough to tell you about, or I'm afraid of retaliation. And because of this, we miss the opportunity to learn about the incidents um, that are happening for our learners in the trenches, and then to use that information to make the learning community fairer and more inclusive. And we are particularly challenged around incidents that don't rise to the level of egregious mistreatment. And I'm referring to microaggressions, micro insults, micro invalidations, um, where the person may not even be aware of the bias that they are expressing. Um, but we need to know that information. Students are only gonna tell us this if they trust, first of all, that we're gonna protect their safety. And second, that this information is gonna be used in real time to make visible changes in their learning community. And I'm going to end with the last recommendation, which is training. And this is more controversial. Um, the effectiveness of training, and I'm not going to be explicit about what kind, whether it's implicit bias, if it's allyship, safe space, upstander, schools can decide for themselves the training that they think is mo most important. But the impact of that training is variable, and we know that. And it depends on the content, and it depends on the delivery, and frankly, it depends on the acceptance that participants are bringing to the process. Um, so, social science just hasn't pointed us yet to evidence-based training, you know, that's gonna successfully reduce discriminatory behaviors at the individual level. It may never do that. So why am I saying we should do it? Um, I think that providing this training says that mitigating bias and discrimination against LGBTQ is an institutional priority. And if we know that one-off training is not effective, it could be that regular and ongoing participation is gonna yield a different result. 
And finally, I think that this may increase not just the interest of individuals, but to give them the confidence and the tools to take part in a much harder work, which is making uh, dismantling bias at the structural and institutional level. I have also used the word mandatory, and that is also controversial because it's a major impediment for many institutions, including my own. And there's also a lot of evidence that says that mandatory training backfires. If making training mandatory across an entire institution is impossible, then I think we need to focus on our gatekeepers. Um, and I am referring to teaching faculty who grade. I'm referring to admissions committee members who get to decide who comes into our community, honors and award selection committees who, um, who identify the ambassadors for our programs. And um, in my last statement, um, the other mandatory training I'm gonna talk about is, is curriculum, which is gonna be a nice segue because I'm about to hand this back to Dr. Schuster. Um, we know that there is an association between required curricula in um, health equity and a decrease in the biases that um, learners have related to gender identity and sexual orientation. And so with that, I'm going to hand this back to Dr. Schuster to do the third recommendation. Thanks, Dana. Um, so recommendation three, we need to do better with integrating equity into health professions curricula. And thank you for setting that up, Dana. Um, first, we need to teach about health concerns specific to sexual and gender minority people and teach skills for providing appropriate care. Too often in clinical education, gay men are mentioned only in a discussion of HIV and then other sexual and gender minorities get passing reference at best. There is so much to learn here. There are whole textbooks. Students should learn about higher rates of breast cancer in lesbians, due in part to their being less likely to become pregnant. But of course, they also do become pregnant and we can't forget that. And students should learn that lesbians often are not offered pap smears because it's assumed they've never had intercourse with a man. And speaking of that, transgender men may need to get pap smears, which might not occur to clinicians who haven't learned about transgender care. And, and on and on, there, these are just a few examples. There are many, many, many. Um, students should also learn accurate terminology and not make assumptions. They can ask about a person's pronouns. Um, Dana already just talked a lot about that. Um, and they should be able to take a history using gender neutral language that does not presume the gender of a patient's sexual partners. They shouldn't presume that the parents of a pediatric patient are a mother and a father. Well, I'm gonna personalize this. I hope that's okay, Holly. Um, I remember being startled when I was asked whether my kid's mother would be bringing the immunization card, which put me in the position of explaining that my son had two dads and that I did actually have the card with me. Um, I resisted pointing out that as a pediatrician, I could have recited his immunization record from memory. Um, and, um, and students can learn that it's okay to ask what language the person uses. As one patient might describe themselves as gender non-binary and another might describe themselves as gender queer. We should just ask and find out what words people use. Next, sexual and gender minority patients should appear even when their identity is not central to the particular condition being studied. So for example, a child experiencing, child experiencing an asthma exacerbation can show up in the ER with his two moms. A man who comes in to talk about um, a knee replacement can be accompanied by his male partner. Not everything has to be about HIV. We also wanna educate students about disparities and biases faced by LGBTQ plus populations. And we need to challenge students to assess their own biases. Students should be aware of the effects of societal stigma and discrimination on sexual and gender minority health and how that translates into suspicion with the healthcare system. They should also recognize that this discrimination can come from their patients' own families and close friends so that the very people whom others might turn to for support when there's a challenge may be the exact ones whose rejection is most painful. All of this contributes to the higher rates of anxiety and depression and harmful substance use found among sexual and gender minority people. And finally, 
students need to learn to think about their own biases and how to work through them. That's actually something that we all should be working on. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Stefan for the fourth recommendation. Thank you. So the fourth recommendation is to increase the number of health profession students, trainees, faculty, and institutional administrators and leaders from historically marginalized and excluded populations. And I think that this is really, really critical as we look to diversify health professions and also to create more inclusive environments for patient populations. So one of the things that we talked about a lot at the conference is that we need to measure. Uh, so we're not collecting data, as we already mentioned, on LGBTQ identity. And because we're not collecting it, we can't really tell the story of what's happening to LGBTQ people who join our organization. Are they successful? Are they promoted? Do they have the same level of success as their non-LGBTQ counterparts? Also, are we looking at things like the intersections of race and gender identity and sexual orientation? So we need to collect the data, we need to analyze it, and then we need to really be intentional about growth. So how do we increase the representation, not only among the workforce, but also with the executive leadership teams and board of governors, boards of directors, it's really important that we look at this at all levels because our leaders and in institutions should reflect the diversity of our communities, which includes LGBTQ identity. One example of you know, some ways that we can do this very intentionally is by becoming more engaged with community groups. So this is something that actually is promoted among organizations that are going to become leaders in LGBTQ healthcare quality with the human rights campaign. And again, this is something that we can continually look at their standards and criteria for that program, that awards and recognition program to assess our climate and to make sure that we are increasing our, our outreach to the LGBTQ community and also assessing continually how people succeed, grow, and hopefully thrive within our institutions. And I know that we want to keep a lot of time for, for Q&A. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you, panelists. Um, we have a number of questions that are, are coming in from our audience. Um, and let me start by um, combining two questions that get at the issue of collecting uh, data related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, one specifically is how do you use, um, how do you collect it for medical students at Kaiser Permanente, uh, Dr. Schuster? And then more generally, does one have to go through an IRB or is it just included as part of an admissions form? Sure. So, yeah, at the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine, um, we actually collect the data from our applicants. For those who are familiar with medical school applications, um, once um, students get through the larger AMCAS system and they do what's called a secondary application with us, we collect it there. It is not for research purposes. And so we do not need to go through an IRB. And we just have um, items in the list of many questions that we ask and students um, seem to answer them quite comfortably. At least they're not skipping the question. And that's actually very helpful to us. Um, and it is why we have the information to be able to put on our website. And we encourage others to um, put such information on their websites as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question from an attendee is this, given the evidence that up to two thirds of people who are transitioning are not out, it was suggested in the presentation that using or encouraging pronouns is actually potentially counterproductive, pressuring people to potentially lie or come out whether or not they're ready. What are your thoughts on this since you did mention pronouns in the presentation? Stefan, do you wanna try that one? It's a good question. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question and one that I will say, you know, I, I think that there might be multiple perspectives on. Um, there are some people who actually do not advocate for compulsory pronouns or having everyone share their pronouns exactly for that reason, that some people may not be ready to, to share that information that they're about to transition or where they are in the transition process. I am of the mindset that by sharing your pronouns, you create a safe space 
for people, um, you know, regardless of where they are on the, in their transition. Uh, but there are varied perspectives on that. And so I do think that it's a really important point. I welcome Dana or Mark, if you have other thoughts to add on to that. I, I think that we have to listen to um, what people are telling us and pay attention to their discomfort or to their um, confidence. And um, I don't believe that there is ever going to be a single answer to a question um, related to a group who have such different experiences, priorities, and desires. Um, so in every regard, and this includes in the collection of information, we need to be led and to listen to what is going to make the person most comfortable and to feel safest, as, as Stefan said. And I think we hope that candor is what's going to help them feel safest, but we know um, from the litany of statistics that we provided at the beginning of this presentation that there are often good reasons why people don't feel that sense of confidence or safety. And I think we need to honor and listen to that. Um, I'll just add a little bit, which is that, um, and there, there may be a wide range of opinions on this among our panelists, but that I think that um, pronouns uh, should be asked of everybody. I think they should just be a routine question on the intake form. When I, you know, moved to Pasadena for um, to be at this new school and got a new um, physician, I had to fill out a whole form with a million questions. And this could just be one more question. So it's not that we are targeting people we think might um, use pronouns that we might not have guessed. Everyone just reports their pronouns. They can change it later if they want and it becomes just standard and routine and not stigmatizing to be asked your pronouns or to answer the question. But I, I totally respect that there may be other views and I may not have thought of all the implications of that. Thank you. Uh, the next question, can you recommend some established or exemplary trainings for healthcare providers? Another great question. Um, Mark, do you want to try that one? Um, yeah, um, I don't know the full breadth of trainings that are out there, but I do know that the AAMC uh, does have um, a really um, sophisticated training that they've put together, um, a curriculum they've put together that schools can use um, and adapt for their own purposes. And while it is put together by an association that represents medical schools. Um, it's a training that I believe um, various health profession schools could adapt to their own purposes. But, I, um, but I, I do believe that there are other trainings that individual nursing and medical and social work and other schools have put together. And um, what we really need to do is to help us all disseminate the trainings that we've got so that we can learn from each other. If I can just add on, um, if you're looking for direct care providers, part of the journey of becoming leader in, in the Healthcare Quality Index is training. That's a huge component of it. And HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, in their HEI uh, reports and guidelines, they provide a number of references for their training programs, one of them being Fenway. That's used by many organizations, their training. Um, so if you want to look at uh, training specific for providers and, and healthcare workforce members, um, the HEI does have a robust list. Yes, and um, I will also add to that, um, one of our Macy faculty um, scholars, uh, scholar alumni, Cindy Ferranda has um, put into the Q&A that she is aware of a free online training coming very soon that's called CLAS from the Department of Health and Human Services from HHS. So. Um, Certainly keep your eye out for that, but I also want to underline that we will be um, placing uh, resources on our website um, in follow-up to this uh, webinar. Thank you. The next question, what pitfalls exist for an organization to begin to ask about sexual orientation and gender identity? Ophthalmology has its own match and we are interested in asking applicants about this.
Um, yeah, go ahead, Dana. I was going to say that when you're asking um, people important questions about identity, the um, responses must also always, I'm sorry, um, be voluntary and um, with no stigma or, conse or negative consequence attached to either responding or not responding. Um, and I think that the more that the um, ophthalmology um, society can um, signal their acceptance um, to students and the safer they make their environment appear, the more likely it is that students will respond with giving this information. And I'll add that um, you may find that you get some amazing applicants who um, otherwise might not have applied, who um, as they see the field um, becoming more inclusive and they're first year students and they hear about it, by the time they're third and fourth year students and thinking of what to go into, ophthalmology may start to feel more inviting and more welcoming and you won't be missing out on some amazingly talented students. Thank you. Next question, what recommendations do you have for faculty when a student tells them that they reported mistreatment and it was ignored? I wanna support my students, but the administration did not. Suggestions? Dana, I think that one is for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, every institution tends to have an ombuds person um, who is not inside an administration of the school, but external to that. And um, every institution also has um, a Title IX office, depending on the nature of the complaint. Um, I, I, would, um, I would think that those would be important resources for this individual to use. Thank you. Um, the next question I'm gonna to combine to, um, sexual and gender minority students have identified increasing visibility as important to them, but there is a natural fear about negative consequences of being out. What can institutions do um, and what can people do to create spaces in which health profession students feel they can be open about their sexual orientation and gender identity? Oh, this is such an important question. So thank you for raising it. Um, Mark, you have um, the lived experience, I think, related to this question and, and now the um, real life work experience related to this question. Would you like to um, start off and then I'll also invite uh, Stefan to comment on this. Um, yeah, um, I think there's a lot we can all do. Um, <clears throat> just to name a few things. Um, the first is to have faculty and staff, especially people in leadership positions, but really people across the board who are open and willing to um, discuss their lived experiences um, when um, students are looking for people who will share their experiences. And um, I think we need to actively recruit from these groups. And, um, you know, even, even when you do have um, people who are open about being um, sexual and gender minority um, faculty and staff, students may not always um, hear easily. So at my last job, um, there was something called the out list and that let students see the names of sexual and gender minority faculty and staff who were willing to self-identify, who were willing to be on the list. You had to say that you're willing to be on the list. Um, so no one was being pushed to be more open than they felt comfortable with. And I think students, um, at a minimum feel reassured seeing names on the list, um, but they also can reach out to folks on the list when they're looking for mentorship, particularly when it lists um, what specialty a, a clinician is in. Um, and um, I'd also say that to reference something that I, I think Dana talked about earlier, when an application, the application process asks about sexual orientation and asks gender um, with um, a set of answer options that's just not male and female, but keeps going, I think that sends a signal to students that this um, is a school that is trying to create an inclusive environment. And of course, then there are setting up affinity groups for students and, um, and also faculty and staff who are not sexual or gender minorities themselves can convey support by having the kind of stickers that were on Dana's slide um, or something that says, 
safe space on top of a pink triangle or a rainbow flag. Um, those of you um, listening may have seen them. And that's, that can be incredibly powerful for a student to see on the office of someone they're going to meet with. Stefan, would you like to weigh in on that? Yes, I, I would just echo the importance of being out, you know, for those who are comfortable, who are in faculty and leadership roles. Um, one of the first academic talks I ever uh, got to hear was when I was uh, at the end of my high school journey. I think I was a junior or senior. And I had the opportunity to hear Judy Shepherd, Matthew Shepherd's mom, speak. Uh, she was at, uh, speaking at Southern Illinois University. And uh, she talked about the fact that, you know, this is back at the turn of the century again. So, you know, she was talking about, you know, all of the, all of the people who were, you know, she described it as in the shadows, who weren't comfortable with coming out. If we all knew that we had a brother, a sister, a colleague, a friend who identified as LGBTQ, then we would create a better, a better world for all, all of us. The challenge with that, which I fully subscribe to in, in my own life, and I've made that personal decision. However, you know, I do think that we have to recognize that, you know, there are many people of color in particular who that may not be a comfort zone for them. And so, you know, my career in healthcare leadership, I've known many people who have confided to me that they are, you know, a member of the LGBTQ community, but would not ever see themselves publicly sharing that in a professional context. So I think it goes back to, you know, how do we create safe spaces? How do we communicate that we are a safe space? How do we integrate this information into the curriculum? I know that there's studies for both nursing and medicine where there's very low representation of LGBTQ related content in the curriculum. Also in our healthcare organizations, are we doing things like celebrating Pride Month, coming out day? So I think that those are some steps that we can move toward so that we create an inclusive environment and make people feel comfortable coming out. Can I add one, one additional? Yes, Holly? please, um, please. Thank you so much to Mark and Stefan for what you have to say. Um, I think that sometimes we make this, um, make this seem like this is a, a more complicated or specific area than, than it needs to be. Um, Having a um, competency in diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that we turned into one of the core strengths that we have in all of our hiring practices. Um, this is for staff. It's what I'm in charge of. I'm not in charge of hiring faculty. But along with things like communication skills, organizational skills, leadership, um, the ability to um, support an inclusive learning environment is, is um, considered as a factor of employment, whether that is the actual work of the person or not. And that way that it, this doesn't center on one or two individuals in a siloed office, um, but as a core strength or, or a skill for people whose expertise might be in student um, affairs or admissions or curriculum or financial aid. And, um, and that has been very effective in our office for creating a much more inclusive environment for LGBTQ among many other um, affinity um, groups. Thank you, all very important ideas. Thank you. The next question, um, many times when we discuss increasing LGBTQ plus representation, what that translates to is white gay men and white lesbians. What are strategies for increasing representation of trans individuals and LGBTQ people of color? Oh boy, another really important uh, question. Stefan, do you want to take that one? Yes, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a really important question and, you know, one that I think that we're all struggling to figure out. Um, you know, I think that it's something that is going to be a journey and evolution for us. I do think that if we look at, you know, community-based organizations, partnerships with HBCUs and other institutions, um, really casting a broad net in how we look at recruiting uh, students and also developing uh, students and healthcare professional workforce in a very an intentional way. I think that we can look at some of the workforce and pathway development programs that have been developed in, in very targeted and specific ways to, let's say, grow the number of nursing students in a particular demographic area. 
we should be looking at that as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. How can we look at someone who identifies as being trans, who may have interest in health and never has had the access because of the tremendous barriers that trans individuals face in employment and higher education, but they have all of the capabilities in order to do that and be successful. I think that it takes us really saying, we know that we have a problem. We shouldn't do our traditional approach of waiting for people to just miraculously appear and apply. I think that it's really gonna take us as healthcare leaders, as healthcare educators to be intentional and go after high school students who may be LGBTQ. I know that when I was a high school student, um, I would sneak from my conservative parents' home and I would go to the LGBTQ resource center that had meetings for youth groups. And those youth groups were you know, quite diverse actually. So I think that we need to be really intentional. We don't know what talent exists in the LGBTQ community and community of color because we haven't been intentional about it. Good. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Mark or Dana, do you want to um, add to that? Um, I think Stephen really covered it um, as well as it could be covered. I, I guess I'll just say that, you know, I started running through my head everyone I could think of among our leadership and faculty and staff who are, um, who I know to be LGBTQ plus, and um, it's mostly non-white. Um, men and women, um, and um, and that, um, and, I, and then I was trying to figure out how we did that. And I think um, when it was for positions that involved a search firm, we made it very clear <coughs> that we wanted um, authentic, um, authentic people of color, um, people who are black, um, Latinx, Asian. Um, to be in the list of people who were being brought to us. And in the process, um, some of them were sexual and were mostly sexual minorities. And, um, and then we wound up being able to hire people. I think partly by, um, by it being very clear that this was an environment that was welcoming of um, LGBTQ plus people. And so we do have a wide diversity among our sexual and gender minority population, and we do have both. Um, so, um, but Stefan really gave the answer, and I'm just thinking through that we, um, we did achieve um, and are keeping trying to continue to achieve what he was referencing. Well, I think uh, Stefan said, be intentional, um, and he said it in all caps, bold font, and Mark, you gave some very practical steps. Um, about how you actually direct a search firm to bring you the types of candidates um, that you'd like to see and interview and ultimately hire. Okay, Peter, back to you. Thank you. Um, we are approaching the hour soon and we have many more questions than we'll be able to get to. So we have time for only one more question. Where do you recommend a health professions program, specifically nursing, begin? when attempting to update and revise their policies and practices to eliminate the bias that is contained within them? Oh boy, that, um, that could be the subject of an entire webinar, but thank you for asking that. And Dana, I think I'll start with you because I know you have some experience um, with this question. Um, where do you begin to change as a culture um, and to make the culture change explicit in your policies and practices. Um, I, I think that that is such, that that is the hardest question of all. Like where do you, where do you tease that apart? Um, I'm going to go back to say that without leadership commitment and resources, um, you won't get very far. But I think it's also important for people to have a shared belief in that mission. And that actually takes time. It takes conversation and discussion, but real culture change does not happen unless everyone buys in and believes that not only is it possible to do it, but that it's important to do it. Um, I always am a big fan of the low hanging fruit. Um, start with what is easy. Start with what is manageable on a small level. And then from there, with those quick wins and the enthusiasm and engagement that that produces, start moving outwards. 
find your champions, um, find your allies and um, begin a process of working with them um, in, a, in a coordinated way. And I think that um, the other thing to understand is that this kind of change takes a very long time. And um, you have to have um, the commitment to um, hang in there and to wait. And I, I think um, what about what Mark said is, is you make this change now, three years from now, students are gonna be like, oh, well that, that looks like a, an, of interest to me. So you don't know what's going to happen from the changes that you make today. You might not see an impact for years, but it will grow because people need to trust that you are being candid and sincere and, and that you really believe in the importance and value of what you're doing. In the Thank you. Um, Mark or Stefan, would you like to um, add to that? I'll just add really quickly that, um, you know, and I agree with everything that Dana said. I think that part of where you began and having taught in the school of nursing, um, you know, it, there can be many challenges where people uh, just don't understand that there's even a problem. And that's why I always try to begin by telling the story. What has happened to LGBTQ people so that they understand that while there are his, there's a history of oppression and discrimination with other groups that we see more readily available in terms of our current discussions and rightfully so, at the same time, we need to be aware of the issues that are affecting the LGBTQ population. I also am a firm uh, supporter of assessments, whether that be the implicit, implicit association test, you can do the gay straight one. Uh, they just launched, I believe, um, one for trans identity. If you go to the Project Implicit site at Harvard, there are also other assessments that you can use just on knowledge. You know, are they aware of some of the health disparities and issues, screening factors, for instance, that Mark mentioned for the LGBTQ patient population? So I think that when you tell people about the problem and show them real lived experiences of people, and then also show that they may have a knowledge deficit in, in addressing some of these issues, because many times clinicians are the first to say, oh, I'm inclusive. <laughs> you know, I believe in diversity. You have to show them that there's a problem is how I believe you began. Mark, anything to add? No, I know we're at the hour and I don't want to use up um, your closing remarks time. So um, I, I thought those answers were really great and um, I don't think I can add to them. Great, okay, well, thank you. In fact, um, I would like to thank all of our panelists. Um, this has been a very rich conversation. I want to thank all of the attendees for the um, thoughtful uh, questions that you put into today's um, question and answer. I would like to remind everyone that we will be posting the recording of today's webinar on the Macy Foundation website um, within the week. So look for it next week if you'd like to um, return and um, listen again to any part of this webinar or if you'd like to share it with others. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, because we have received such um, a robust attendance and many more questions than we were able to get to today, we will also be following up this webinar with a, pa a podcast and um, the panelists um, who you've heard from today have agreed to do a, a follow-up podcast. So stay tuned, um, there will be more to come on that front. On front of you, uh, on the screen in front of you, you see um, upcoming webinars that we already have planned. The next webinar um, will focus on anti-Black racism and that one um, will be um, hosted by Valerie Montgomery Rice. Um, Dr. Rice is the president and dean at the Morehouse School of Medicine and her colleague, Dr. Joseph Kirshner, who is the Dean at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And then um, we have future webinars that will focus on people with disabilities and a follow-up part two um, to nursing in the clinical learning environment. And um, we 
already had um, one webinar that focused on nursing. That one ended up focusing a little bit more on the classroom kinds of issues of bias and discrimination. And the follow-up is going to be um, squarely focused in the clinical learning environment. And so um, stay tuned, there's more to come. But again, I wanna thank everyone, our panelists and all of you who participated with us in today's webinar. Peter, back to you. Thank you, Holly. This concludes today's webinar. You can find the conference recommendations on our website at macyfoundation.org, where you can also sign up for periodic email alerts from us. To all of our attendees, thank you for participating. Have a good day and stay safe and healthy.